Right, so we'll um, move on uh, now to the discussion of low carbon steel. So the, the idea here is now we're going, we've, um, we've learned about the technology uh, that is used to make steels and now let's look into the details of how certain steel grades are, are produced on these lines. Um, and um, what their composition is and, and, and why we choose certain processing parameters rather than others um, on the basis of the physical metallurgy of, of these uh, grades. There was a last point in uh, previous lectures that I didn't cover which had to do with fatigue. Uh, I propose you read that um, in the text. It's not very difficult. Um, and anyway, I noticed that we weren't going to use this in the um, um, rest of the course, so I, um, I would rather move on to low carbon steels today. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll talk about these uh, formable uh, low carbon steels. Uh, fast amount of this type of steel is produced, hot rolled strip or a cold rolled strip and then yield uh, after the cold rolling. These may or may not be coated. Uh, and so we'll try to understand uh, how we uh, achieve certain microstress, certain properties of these steels. Uh, These steel are actually very simple. You know, basically, they're, most of it is uh, <coughs> just iron, 98, 97, 98 percent of the composition is iron. Uh, they're ferritic. Um, and um, so it's a very simple microstructure. And um, when you see um, cars today on the road, um, most of the, um, the body structure of these cars is is made of these this type of steels, uh, you know, you, but depending on the the part uh, that is used to make this um, car, uh, we will be using different types of steels. And although the structure, the the, the chemistry is very uh, is very lean. I mean, there there are not many alloying elements. <coughs> we can achieve a very wide range of properties through processing. So for instance, if um, you uh, look at the car at a panel, at, at the, excuse me, at the, um, at the hood here, uh, you, you have here a cut out of a hood like this, so you have these outer panels have to be extremely formable, yes? Um, and their visual appearance is very important. Hmm? But the, the, the uh, strengthening panel below here um, has even more uh, demanding uh, formability uh, issues. As you can see, there are cut up parts, there are holes in it, etc. And on top of that, you, um, it's a, a part that needs to be strong. Um, even stronger parts are many parts that are not visible in the car. Um, struct we call them structural parts hmm? instead of uh, outer panels. And for instance, you have these, um, these uh, impact beams that are uh, mounted in your door to protect you against um, side collisions. Yes. Uh, and there are many other parts like that that are uh, very high strength materials. So we need different properties. Hmm? And we've already seen that um, uh, we need, we definitely need for all these parts, we need some, some level of formability. So that uh, brings me to 
um, important issues with the, uh, the carbon steels. So when we talk about the formable steels, uh, we, we usually divide them in two classes. The low carbon steels, yes, and the IF steels. Hmm? IF steels being interstitial free steels. Interstitial free means no solute carbon and solute nitrogen. Whereas here, we can have solute carbon and nitrogen in the microstructure. These steels are very often, instead of calling them low carbon steel, we also call them aluminum killed low carbon steel, AKLC, and uh, as the, the aluminum killing refers to the fact that we, during in secondary steel making, we add aluminum to bind the uh, oxygen uh, that is um, uh, in the steel. Hmm? Now, it's important here to, to when, we, when I say IF steel, it means interstitial free. It doesn't mean that there is no carbon or nitrogen. There is nitrogen and there is carbon in these steels, but we say the carbon and nitrogen are stabilized. They're stabilized as nitrides and carbides, and we'll see uh, uh, what that is, but it basically means that we stabilize them by uh, adding titanium, a little bit of titanium, to form titanium nitride and titanium carbide. That's one way, or there are, there's an alternative way of doing this, where you add titanium and niobium, and where the titanium stabilizes the nitrogen, and niobium stabilizes the carbon, and forms niobium carbide. Hmm? Okay, and why do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, one of the reasons why we do this is because if you have solute carbon and nitrogen in your material, yes, your material will age, yes, and this will give you a yield point elongation, yes. And when you have yield point elongation, it gives you visual defects on your pressed panels, on press form panels. So you don't want this, okay? Whereas if you have a material that doesn't have this yield point elongation, for example, because there is no nitrogen or carbon in this yes, steel, then you have a continuous stress strain curve and there are no strain marks on the pressed parts. The reason why these marks appear is because when you have a yield point elongation, it means that the deformation is not uniform but localized. So suddenly, a part of the steel deforms, yes, and uh, and that's visible. That's visible, and so it's a. It doesn't mean that the panel is about to be, you know, has low uh, um, mechanical properties or anything, or is about to fracture. It's purely a visual appearance issue. Yes, but for many uh, uh, products, visual appearance is very important, right? Particular um, cars, consumer products, um, um, uh, steel furniture, etc. All right. That's one thing. The other thing that is important, and we already know this, is the fact that to achieve high uh, formability, we need to have a high R factor. Yeah? R and this R value, uh, it can be expressed as the mean R value, yes? And what we know already, uh, right, is that um, we need to have a so-called uh, fiber texture. Now, if we have 
flat rolled products, we need to have one, one, one direction parallel to the normal direction. Yes, that's the, this fiber, right? And, and you can see here, this is the intensity of the one, one, one reflection peak in X-ray diffraction, yes? If um, I have a lot of grains that have this orientation, then this ratio of the intensity of the 1-1-1 one, one, one reflection over the 1-0 reflection will be high, yes? And as a result, I will have a high R value, yeah? So that's, we know, I mean, this, this tells me, tells you that the, uh, the R value is related to texture, yeah? and in particular, the 1-1-1 one, one, one fiber texture, gamma fiber texture, also called it. Yeah? The other thing that's important is the carbon mass content. And we see that um, if we can achieve um, uh, low enough carbon contents, yes, low enough being, right, uh, this here is 0 0.001 carbon, so that is 0.00110 uh, mass percent, so that means, um, so 10 to the minus 4 mass percent, that's equal to 10 ppm, 10 ppm, this is 10 ppm. If my carbon mass uh, content or weight percent is higher than 10 ppm, I see a constant decrease in the R value. So formability of steel improves as we have lower carbon contents. Mm -hmm. What is the carbon content typically of an IF steel? Well, it's about 10 to 20 ppm. Yes, it's extremely low, yes. But uh, low carbon steels will always have a higher uh, a lower, excuse me, R value formability lower because of this carbon. Hmm? Yes. However, things are more complex than just uh, removing the yield point and getting a high R value. Uh, your properties will depend on almost all the processing parameters, but there are a number of key parameters, yes? For instance, for the low carbon sheet steel, yes, in hot rolling, we find that the higher the hot rolling temperature is, the more my R value increases. Yes. However, yes, there is a very strong dependence on the coiling temperature. Mm -hmm. If we have low coiling temperatures, we can achieve high R values. If we have a high coiling temperature, the same steel will give me a much lower formability. And the reason is, as you already know, and we'll go through it quickly today again, is because of the precipitation of aluminum nitride hmm, during batch annealing. In the cold rolling, so the same material, yes, in the cold rolling and in the annealing, we'll also see a dependence of the processing, of, of the RM value on the processing. Hmm? For instance, the more we cold roll in general, yes, uh, low carbon steel, the more we pancake the grains, yes, and get the grains oriented in such a way that we get 111 parallel to the normal direction after annealing. We cannot, however, over-deform the material. If you over-deform the material, if you do more than 70% of deformation, the uh, R value decreases again. That's one thing. Second thing is the anneal when you do the annealing, it's important to increase the temperature of the, at which you carry out the annealing, but you cannot transform heat up so high that you start transforming the steel back to austenite. You form austenite. 
If you do this, so you heat up above A1, the texture improvements disappear and your R value decreases again. The mechanical properties are a function of the grain size, are the function of the composition, yes. Uh, obviously, uh, you know what the effect is of the grain size on the strength. You know what the effect is of phosphorus, manganese, and silicon on the strength. These are uh, solid solution hardeners. Uh, and you also know that temper rolling, yes, is a, has an effect on the... Um, uh, the properties. Maybe we can um, have a look at what is the effect of the properties on temper, of temper rolling on the properties, so you understand this graph a little better. Yes. Um, when you when you temper roll, yes, you remember that's the the, the the rolling you do, yes, after annealing, right? So after annealing. Again, a low carbon steel, you're left with some carbon and nitrogen in solution. So this, these guys give me this uh, Luther's elongation, right? By temper rolling it, yes, I uh, remove this, yes? I remove this, uh, however, so, so what I do is I I deform the material, yes. I don't do it correct. I don't do it correctly. But this would be the, the full stress strain curve. Let me use another color here. So if I temper roll it, I basically bring the material beyond this point, yes. And then I I unload the material, right? I just deform it for, uh, say. Uh, half a percent to one percent, yeah? and so now next time I deform the material, for instance during press forming, so this would be the red is uh, temper rolling, next time when I do the press forming, yes, my, this is, will be the stress strain curve that I get. Yes, that's the, the relevant uh, stress strain curve, right? So what happens here, hmm? you see that the RM value, RM value, uh, RM is this, that's the same as uh, UTS, RE is the same as yield strength, and A80 is the same as the elongation, for your information. Yeah. Um, what, what do we see? We see that the, the UTS doesn't change. It doesn't change, right? So as a function of the temper rolling, temper rolling, uh, the deformation, the amount of deformation you give, the UTS stays the same, yes. The yield strength, yes, decreases, yes, because, um, and we, we know this because the, the yield point here will be higher than the yield point in this case, yes. And it depends how much, how much deformation we give, yes. So it has this, this shape, yeah, the yield stress, yeah, and there is a minimum, okay? And what happens to the elongation? Well, the elongation goes down, right? Why does the elongation go down? Because in, in the case of the, the black curve, what was the elongation that I could give was this, right? Say so if the material breaks here, yes? This was it. Now, how much elongation can I give is this one, right? So it's smaller. Obviously, the more you pre-deform, you pre-strain the material, the less, the lower the residual uh, elongation you have. So that explains 
this, this graph in, in the corner here. So there are many parameters during the processing that will influence formability and mechanical properties, okay? All right. And we already know that one of the, uh, the key aspects in uh, what happens with the precipitation of carbon or the staying in solution of carbon is related to the way you do the annealing. Yeah? And we already discussed the fact that in, um, in bake hardening, this is bake hardening, you have a very, very slow heating and cooling and the whole process lasts several, can, can last a couple of days, right? So the amount of carbon you have in solution will be low because you're very close to uh, um, thermodynamic equilibrium and you know there's very little uh, solubility of carbon in ferrite. So you basically, in batch annealing, go along the solubility line when you do the processing. Carbon. That's not the case in continuous annealing, yes, where you do the process very quickly, yes, in a few minutes, and um, as a consequence, in, and, and uh, we see in the lines that there is an overaging section to allow for the precipitation of the cementite. Yeah. When we process aluminum killed low carbon steels, we need to use lines with this overaging. Because in, during this overaging, we nucleate uh, cementite and we decrease the solute carbon content by the growth of these cementite particles. If we use uh, IF steels, IF steels, yes, we don't need to because the carbon and the nitrogen are stabilized. So in the case of these lines, there is no overaging, no overaging necessary. Okay. Okay. So as a consequence, yes, we also see that the processing or the, let me say, the sensitivity of the mechanical properties to the processing will depend on whether you do an annealing via a batch annealing route or via a continuous annealing route. Hmm? Um, let's... Um, maybe have a, uh, let's, let's move on, let's not uh, talk about this at this stage, let's, talk, let's first talk about some composition. So we have an idea of the, uh, the alloys that are being used. So, uh, so the low carbon, again the AKLC steels, the formable low carbon sheet steels uh, typically they will have central elements will be carbon, which are in the range of 200 to 500 ppm, yes? The nitrogen, yes, in these steels is typically, is always below 100 ppm if we're using BOF hot metal, yes? Uh, if you're using electric arc furnace, hot metal, the nitrogen content can be as high as 100 ppm or even slightly higher. But typically, if you use BOF material, the nitrogen content is 40 ppm. Yes? It's very difficult to get much lower. Yes? And you remember how this is being done. This is done... Uh, to get very low levels of, of nitrogen and carbon is, is done by vacuum metallurgy. Yes? But the low carbon steels, we don't do vacuum metallurgy, right? Okay. The other point that's important is the aluminum. Hmm? The aluminum is 200 to 
500 ppm. That's the range. Typically, it's around three, you know, if, if, if I want to be more, uh, it's, it's around three to 400 uh, ppm. That's it's a more narrower range. And then you have manganese uh, is um, uh, 50, um, 1,500 to 2,000 ppm. So that corresponds to 0 0.15, 0 0.15 to 0 0.2% uh, uh, of manganese. Um, that means there are almost no alloying additions in this kind of steel, yes? There are, the only thing that we really do is adjust the composition, right? But the alloying additions, so um, you can see here, uh, we're talking about 99% of iron, right? So it's basically ferrite that, that we're looking at. Right, so the aluminum uh, and the nitrogen play a very big role in these low carbon steels. Yes. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the precipitation of aluminum nitrite. Yes. So the nitrogen is less than 100 ppm, it's typically 40 ppm, and the aluminum, as I said, uh, 300 to 500 ppm or 300 to 400 is more exact. So let's see what situation we have here if we assume there is 100 ppm of nitrogen, yes, and we have uh, about, say, 370 ppm of aluminum, yes, in our steel. Hmm? Um, and we look at the graph of the solubility of aluminum nitride hmm, in austenite to start with. Uh, then at uh, eight, uh, 980 degrees C, this is the solubility line. Right? This is the solubility line. So remember what this means. This means that all the composition that are below here, yes, the aluminum nitride will be in solution. Compositions above this line Yes, will give me aluminum nitride precipitation, yes, in thermodynamic equilibrium. Yes? So if I have 100 ppm of nitrogen and 370 ppm of aluminum, yes, I have this point here, and that means that I will have precipitation of aluminum nitride. Right, so on the basis of austenite solubility data, Aluminum nitride should precipitate in the austenite. However, it does not. Yes? Because the kinetics of the precipitation of aluminum nitride are very low. Right? So basically, even though the aluminum nitride is not very soluble in the austenite, when we process a low carbon steel, yes? The aluminum nitride in the hot mill, in the hot mill, the aluminum nitride does not form. Yes, it does not form. And you can see this here. This is the precipitation diagram, precipitation uh, temperature time diagram for aluminum nitride. This is the precipitation curve for aluminum nitride. This is in austenite, and you can see that it takes a very, very long time, yes, for us to start noticing uh, the precipitation. You can see here we're talking about uh, uh, this is a log scale again, so 50 is about here somewhere, right? So you can see it takes like 50 minutes for aluminum nitride to precipitate. 50 minutes, that's an hour. It's, you know, by the time. Uh, an hour is passed, the, the slab has long been processed. Yes. So it doesn't precipitate. However, we know that in the run out table, yes, the aluminum nitride, uh, excuse me, the austenite transforms to ferrite, yes, and the solubility of aluminum nitride is even lower in the ferrite, yes. In this case, 
we do get very much faster precipitation kinetics. Yes, you can see here, very uh, sharp nose here and takes just a few, uh, a much shorter time to, to form the, uh, the aluminum nitride. Hmm? Now, um, we have to be careful, of course, because um, if, if we're looking at the real steel, right, um, uh, low carbon steels, um, when, when you pass the transformation curve, you don't go from austenite to ferrite. Yeah? You go through an intercritical region, right? So, there, so in that region, this is the precipitation curve. And of course, you can also see because it's a C curve, yes, the rate of precipitation of the aluminum nitride is high at 800 degrees C, but at 700 degrees C and lower, it's again very slow. Right? So by choosing the coiling temperature right, we can have either a lot of aluminum nitride or very little, right? So high coiling temperatures, yes, and um, give me a lot of aluminum nitride precipitated in after uh, the runout table in the coil, in the hot coiled, or if I have a low uh, uh, coiling temperature, I can just keep it in solution. Yes? And so, and even though aluminum nitride is thermodynamically not very soluble in austenite and has a very, an even smaller solubility in ferrite, yes, because of the kinetics of the precipitation, I can still suppress the aluminum nitride formation. Hmm? All right. So, so when you look at the, the, the processing of low carbon steels in uh, a hot strip mill, hmm, we're basically processing the material up to the finishing mill in the austenite range. So we have the roughing, the finishing, and then you cool down in the runout table, and then you can choose what do you want to do. Yes, what do you want to do in the cold strip mill? What do you want to do in the annealing? And what's more important, what properties do you want to achieve eventually? Hmm? So you can do. Um, so first of all, you need to ch to decide. Well, am I going to process this steel in a batch annealing furnace after cold rolling or in a continuous annealing furnace or am I going to galvanize this, this material because uh, the application requires coating. Yes? Um, so you have to decide this. If you, uh, the steel is processed in continuous annealing, you, your coiling temperature must be low. Why? To keep the aluminum nitride in solution. Right? Remember, um, a few lectures ago we, we talked about, and I'll, I'll show you the diagram again, the figure again, so you, you remi remember uh, what I was talking about. The coiling temperature is high, yes? if you want to do continuous annealing. Why? Because you want to precipitate the aluminum nitride. Yes? Because if you don't precipitate it here, you will have it in your product. And your material will be very, very quickly aging. Yes? Okay? So different coiling temperatures for different, yes? That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, carbon, right? We, we know that the carbon uh, is not soluble in the ferrite, so it's got to precipitate out, yes? And we want it to precipitate out because we do not want solute carbon, yes, in our 
uh, in our ferrite. Why? Because it gives me this aging. And why is this aging uh, a problem? Because you get these looters, looters bands. Yeah? So you have to decide here what, what type of carbon yeah, precipitate do you want. And in particular, do you want a fine carbon? Do you want perlite or what? Yeah? And that's also decided by the coiling temperature. If you have a high coiling temperature, yes, your a high coiling temperature, the you will first get the transformation, yes, and then you will get the cementite will precipitate in the coil in situations of very low cooling. Yes? So this is when you cool in the in the uh, Renault table, you have about 20 to 30 degrees per second. And then when you cool in, in the coil, your, co your uh, cooling rate is like 20 degrees per hour, but much smaller. Right? So that's why you have a change in slope here. Hmm? Okay. So when I do a high temperature, I actually don't form perlite. Hmm? I don't. So for those who don't see what I mean is that if you're above, if you, if you do a high coiling temperature like here, yes, and I refer to this here, yes, it means that you coil at this temperature, yes, and that you go very, very slowly through this uh, below the A1 line, yes, and so you, you basically make cementite very slowly and you get blocky cementite. You don't even get uh, perlite. However, if you go to lower temperatures and you go to the perlite transformation on the run out table here, yes, then you basically go right away through your A1 temperature and you make cementite, fine cementite actually. Yes? So whether you know, the coiling temperature will not only have an impact on the aluminum nitride, whether or not it's precipitate, but also the formation and the morphology of the, the cementite. Huh? Okay, so this, this is a... Now, wha why is it that the... Um, and the ferrite, yes? Why is it then when you cool down and the solubility of aluminum nitride is so low, why is it that below a certain temperature, you know, why, why don't you get these particles anymore? Why doesn't the aluminum nitride grow? Huh? Okay. Well, it's, it's actually very simple. So imagine um, I, have, I have already an aluminum nitride particle in, in a piece of steel. In, a, in, in steel, so it's ferrite. Yeah? Solubility of the nitride is almost nothing. You cannot dissolve it. Okay? Now, this piece of, this volume here is, consists of aluminum and nitrogen only. Right? There's no iron here. So this means that to grow, yes, this particle has to absorb aluminum and nitrogen. Yes? And the diffusivity of these two elements is very, very different. Yeah? You know that nitrogen is a interstitial, so the diffusivity of nitrogen is very, very high in comparison to the diffusivity of aluminum. What's more important is that, uh, and I think I've said this in earlier uh, lectures, is that at around 550, yes, the diffusivity of substitutional elements is so low that you can basically assume that they're not diffusing for all practical purposes. Yeah? So they stop diffusing. But if, if the aluminum diffusivity is so low, yes, 
that it doesn't move anymore, the aluminum nitride will not grow, yes? Or, uh, you know, if you look at the start of the uh, growth of the uh, aluminum nitride, it may not even nucleate, yes? Okay, because, uh, and you can see this here, hmm? What, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but first let's look at the temperature here. So this is a temperature axis, and this is a temperature line here. This is the line. And the, so this is the temperature as a function of time. So basically we have a cooling curve, yes? And we look at the growth of the aluminum nitride. We look at the growth of the aluminum nitride by looking at the radius of that precipitate. And we see that at high temperatures, we get a very, very quick growth of the radius, yes? So the particles are growing fast, yes? And then, as, as we reach a certain temperature, the, the radius stops increasing, yes? So at what temperature is this? Well, we look down here, yes? To this range of temperatures, and we see, right, that that is I just said uh, 650, you know, below uh, 600 degrees C, uh, 550 is here, I, yes. So the particles stop growing because there's no diffusion anymore of the uh, aluminum. Okay, so, um, and the, uh, the high rate of precipitation is at above this temperature, right? Where, where you see this very strong increase of the radius of the, uh, the particles. Good, that's all uh, very interesting, but uh, what are the implications? Yes, we know that uh, in production, we're dealing not with little laboratory pieces of material, right? Uh, and that when I say, well, the cooling rate is 30 degrees per second and then it's uh, 20 degrees per hour, uh, that's in general, on average, correct. But there are parts in a coil, for instance, that, that have very different temperature uh, cycles. Hmm? For instance, the outer wraps yes, and the inner wraps are cooled at much higher cooling rates, yes? And uh, they also are, uh, end up being at lower temperatures, yes? Um, and, and the reason is the outer wraps, they cool faster because they're, at, they're exposed at, uh, to the, uh, to, to the, um, the uh, uh, ambient temperature, so they, they're colder. And the inner wraps are cooler because we, um, we roll this um, uh, uh, when we when we roll the um, the strip, it it goes on a mandrel which is cold, right? Mandrel, a piece of cylind cylindrical piece of steel on which you wrap the material. That's cold, so it's it's it cools down quickly. So if you look at the amount of nitrogen that's precipitated when you have a coiling temperature that's high. The high coiling temperature, you would expect high coiling temperature, all the aluminum nitride, so aluminum nitride, as a high coiling temperature, aluminum nitride should precipitate. Yeah. What you see is that that is, in general, that is true, the nitrogen is precipitated, but not the outer wraps and not the inner wraps, yes? And the same with the, uh, the carbides, yes? Because the cooling rates are much higher at the inner and the outer wraps, we get a much more, a, a much different microstructure at the start and the end of the uh, of the um, uh, coils, and um, so you get fine carbides or you get fine politic islands in the microstructure, and as a consequence, 
the strength of uh, these of the steel at the start yeah, and at the end of the strip is much higher than in the strip. Yes? So you're basically making a product that has not homogeneous properties and you can see it's not a little bit, you know, it's 40 megapascal and here the nitrogen is, is basically not precipitated in the outer wraps, yes? So the outer wraps age very quickly, and give you a lot of uh, problems in uh, critical uh, parts that where visual appearance and the absence of uh, yield point is elongation is essential. So what can we do? Well, obviously, one of the things to do is to just get rid of carbon and nitrogen, right? Because they're, they're the ones that, this is due to the carbon, this problem, and this problem is due to the nitrogen, right? So let's get rid of them, right? That's the solution. And that's indeed what happens, and that's indeed, that was indeed the driving force in the development of IF steels, is if we get rid of the nitrogen and the carbon, yes, well, we can't get rid of it 100%. We, we can stabilize them as carbides and nitrides, yes. Then our products will have much more homogeneous properties because whether or not they have uh, higher cooling rates at the start or the beginning will be irrelevant, yes. And that's indeed what you see if you have an, um, if you add, take the same steel and you have make titanium additions to it. Titanium, as you know, is a very strong nitride former, yes. Titanium additions will lead to, excuse me, the, um, uh, the full stabilization of the nitrogen, yes. And so um, there are no problems with uh, the, the stabilization of nitrogen in the, uh, at the start and at the end. And it doesn't matter whether you cool high temperatures or low temperatures, yes? So, uh, so remember for those um, uh, uh, that uh, the low coiling route, yes, is for batch annealing route, yes? You keep the aluminum nitride in solution and the reason is that when you do the batch annealing you have an interaction between the recrystallization and the aluminum nitride precipitation and, and the, the batch annealing furnace with this very low slow heating gives you an ideal uh, cooling rate so that these two processes of aluminum nitride precipitation and uh, recrystallization interact and you get these pan-shaped grains which have a 111 parallel to normal direction texture and a good formability. Right, and, um, and people have studied this uh, development of this texture is rather, is rather complex uh, and <coughs> what appears to be important here is that uh, the 111 texture is developed during the grain, in the grain growth phase of the recrystallization. Hmm? Okay. Now, let's have a look at the impact of the uh, amount of reduction, again, uh, that we give to uh, steels before batch annealing. So if we look at the low carbon aluminum killed steels, yes, we see that the window in which we do the reduction, right, is 50 to 70 or slightly less than 70 percent. Hmm? This is okay, 70 percent because here we have a maximum reduction, okay? Right. The lower 
amount of 50% is related to the fact that if you don't deform enough, the recrystallization will be very slow, right? So you need to deform at least 50% right? reduction. Otherwise, the recrystallization will be incomplete. The maximum reduction is around 70% because if I go beyond that, yes, I get the, the texture uh, develops in the wrong way and I get a reduction in deformability. So you only have a window, a reduction window of 50 to 70% if you lose, use a low carbon steel, yes? Okay, so that means if you need, if you want a final product, yes, your starting hot strip must be within a certain range, right? You don't have so much playing ground, yes? This is also one of the reasons why uh, advantages of IF steels, yes, is you have a much larger uh, range over which you can deform the material, right? And in particular, you can give very large reductions. In the case of IF steels, the uh, properties, forming properties, only become um, worse with increasing cold rolling deformation uh, beyond 80% of the um, deformation. So you can give a lot more uh, uh, deformation to your strip, yes? And it also means that it recrystallizes much faster. Yeah? Recrystallization is very, is very uh, fast. Yeah? Now let's have a look at uh, the compositional effects of the um, uh, the effect of composition on the formability. Uh, it turns out that things are a little bit more complex than you'd want. And it's due to the following. When you let carbon precipitate, yes, so it goes from carbon in solution to a piece of cementite, Fe3C, yes? Um, it turns out, and, 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 and what you want to do to get the high textures, good textures, is you want to have this, yes, this carbon content should be as low as possible, preferably no carbon in solid solution. Now, when we have alloying elements in solution together with carbon, yes, these alloy elements have, may or may not interact with each other. Well, it, there is a very pronounced interaction between carbon and manganese, yes? And although we do not add much manganese, if any, in these low carbon steels, the manganese is there, yes? And the level is typ typical 0 0.15 to 0 0.2, and the manganese has um, as effect that it keeps the carbon in solution because it, it attracts the carbon, yes? So the carbon sticks to the as it were, to the, or close to the uh, manganese atoms, yes? And so it slows down the, the carbide formation, for instance, as a consequence. Hmm? So what we see, yes, when we look at the R value, yes, and uh, we have 1,000 ppm of carbon, then this is our R value here. If we have 400 ppm of carbon, our R value increases, and we're here. If we have 70, if we have less than 100 ppm of carbon, 70 here, 10 ppm here, we see the R value increasing and increasing, yes? If we have an IF steel, a titanium IF steel, there's no solute carbon, so the carbon is present as titanium carbide, and our R value is even higher. You can see. So, Low carbon is very good. 
However, when we add manganese, because of this effect, yeah, the interaction, carbon and manganese, which keeps the manganese in solution, we get a lowering of the mangan of, of the um, the R value. Yes. So there is a complex interaction between manganese and carbon in these steels. Yes. And in particular in the low carbon steels, yes, the optimum R values, yes, seem to be limited to about uh, mean R values to a value of two, yes, in the, this range here. That's been found experimentally, yes. So uh, your, your typical range of manganese constants in the low carbon steel is 0.1 to 0.2, yes, and your carbon contents, yes, are 0.02 to 0.04, yes. That's the optimal range. And that's also the reason why low carbon steels, we usually don't make them with lower than 200 ppm carbon contents. We could make them lower by, uh, for instance, um, uh, decarburizing more in the BOF. We don't. It's not, it doesn't pay off, right? Because of the presence of the manganese, okay? <coughs> oh, okay, and then, uh, so what's here, imp important here, uh, for instance, is you will see that the NIF steels, where the carbon is, stabilizes uh, titanium carbide, the influence of the manganese on the R value is much, much lower. Yeah? Uh, right. Yes, the, t the temper mill. Let's um, have a look at what is the um, effect of uh, the temper mill extension Yes, for uh, excuse me, the uh, the yield strength for the temper mill when I increase the uh, the temper mill extension. So in in this case, yes, in the case of this steel. So we know aluminum killed drawing quality steel. You go through a minimum in the yield strength and then an increase as a function of the temper mill extension. What happens if we have an IF steel? In an IF steel, we never have a, an IF steel has, always has a continuous stress strain curve, titanium IF steel. No yield point elongation. So if you temper roll the material, yes, if you temper roll the material, the only thing that happens is you increase the yield strength, right? So you have a very different response to temper rolling. So um, is it necessary to temper roll IF steels? Well, not, for, not to remove a yield point, yes? But it's still, remember that in, in temper rolling you, you achieve kind of three things, removing the yield point elongation, applying a specific roughness, yes, and final correction to the strip flatness, yes, flatness. Right. So uh, two of these uh, things are still required for the IF steel. Hmm? You, you don't need to remove a yield point elongation, but you do need to apply a specific surface roughness. Remember that's because of tribological reasons that you want the sheet to have uh, a certain roughness, tribological reasons and visual appearance after painting, uh, both things are important, and, and, and to uh, improve the flatness of the sheet, that's also an important point. Okay. So the big thing, big difference between aluminum killed low carbon steels and IF steels is 
we say the robustness of this. This is what we call a robust steel or an alloy design concept. And why is it a robust? Because the properties are not very dependent on changes in processing parameters. Yes? So you can process this steel many different routes and have guaranteed stable properties. So take, for instance, uh, heating rates in uh, continuous annealing, yes? Uh, in annealing, yes? If you, uh, if you look at an, a titanium uh, steel, the properties, the R, Rm value or the R value uh, here, is pretty flat, yes? Pretty flat, that is, in comparison to the aluminum killed steel that's coiled at low temperatures. Hmm? At, um, if we coil at low temperatures, right? Uh, low temperatures, right? We have aluminum nitride in solution, right? And if we have low heating rates, remember the heating rates are, it's important to have low heating rates, Yes, I will start by having high R values because low heating rates, the, the crystallization interacts with aluminum nitride formation. Yes? But as soon as I increase my heating rate, yes, this interaction becomes harder and harder and my RM value disappears. And the reverse is true when I have high coiling temperatures. Hmm? High coiling temperatures, I need to have a uh, high cooling rate, high, um, um, high, high heating rates in continuous annealing conditions to achieve a better, not a high, but a better uh, R value. Hmm? Okay. So, I don't want to give the impression that for titanium steels or titanium niobium steels, yeah, which we call interstitial free steels, there are no issues related to sensitivity to, uh, to uh, processing parameters. O on the contrary, they're also there. Uh, because uh, we still need to form these precipitates. Yes, they still need to be formed. Titanium nitride is usually not a big issue. Titanium nitride, extremely low solubility, very stable uh, precipitate and forms almost readily yeah? uh, and, and fully. But it's not the case with the precipitation of uh, the uh, carbides in, um, in the IF steels. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we see that the, uh, so, so if we use a, a slab, just let's look at this graph here. If you use a slab reheating temperature, that is normal. You remember, slab reheating temperatures are usually in the range of 1200, 1250 to 1300, and maybe slightly, but that's really the range at which we do the, uh, the reheating, yes? And remember, the reason why we go into this temperature range is, one of the reasons is, uh, we want to dissolve all precipitates. Yes, all precipitates. Yeah. So if we do this um, and we um, coil yeah, a temperature at uh, 700 or at 750, yes, we see that uh, this, in this, uh, and we look at the R value at these two, that we obtain at these two temperatures, yes, so um, this line here is the 
the diagonal line. So it basically tells me that there is no effect of the coiling temperature. Yes. And, um, and if I plot the amount of cold reduction, so this, this would be the R value ranges for uh, a reduction of 55% and this for 83%. You can see that I can increase the amount, the, the amount of formability considerably by using a higher reduction. Yes. But I can also do a slab reheating temperature that is not 12, uh, 25, but I can do one that is uh, 1100. Yes. And what I see now, hmm, if I may draw a, line, a horizontal line like this, it's a little bit crooked, I admit, but you can see here suddenly uh, there are no values larger than 1, 2.1 in this case, or maybe one, this one here. Here, most values are higher than uh, 2.1. So, obviously, uh, there is a sensitivity to process parameters, and in particular, uh, the, the slab reheating temperature. Yes? The reason is, of course, related to Precipitation formation. Hmm? Yes, and um, so, and you can also see this goes very far. This this uh, this effect of the slab reheating te temperature goes very fast. Far you can you can uh, you can see that um, if you look at the ODFs here, this ODF here gives me the best gamma fiber, very intense gamma fiber. Yes, and it corresponds to low carbon content and a low slab reheating temperature. Yes? Okay. Usually, uh, you process the steels with this temperature and you see that the gamma fiber is not as sharp. Yes? So you don't actually have the best possible properties. Yes? And the reason is, um, I'll just skip this because, yeah, um, is that it turns out that things are a bit uh, more complex than I uh, started explaining, is that the precipitation of carbon in IF steels can or cannot, it depends on the slab reheating temperature become a function of the sulfur content. And why is that? And you can see here that um, there is a uh, uh, you can let me just perhaps if I uh, yes here. And the reason is very simple. Why, why, is, why is there an effect of the sulfur content? Well, it's, it's, it's related to the, the fact that in uh, uh, austenite, yes, uh, Solubility of carbon is what? It's very high, right? Remember, that was one of the big differences between uh, ferrite and austenite, this carbon solubility, yes? So, uh, forming carbides, yes, uh, in austenite is much harder than forming carbides in ferrite because it's very soluble in austenite, yes? So you, we usually have to wait till we have ferrite to make, to precipitate carbides, yes? But there is one big uh, 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 exception to this rule, and that is the carbosulfides. 
carbosulfide formation is the only way you can precipitate carbides at high temperatures in austenite. But of course, you cannot form them if you don't have sulfur. Okay? And you form them at high temperatures at the right temperature. At, 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 uh, you form it at, at in the slavery heating, uh, during slavery heating, if you're at the right temperature. That is slightly below the, the temperature we use normally of 1250. Because then you can form this. And so this allows you to stabilize carbon in austenite at high temperature. The precipitation sequence of, uh, um, in, in uh, IF steel is very interesting. Yeah? And it's, again, uh, more complex than we would like, but, uh, and goes as follows. At high temperature, we form titanium nitride. So stabilizing uh, nitrogen with titanium addition all w works always. Um, and you need about, if you have 40 ppm of nitrogen, you need about 100, say, ppm of titanium. Yeah? Next thing that happens is, as you, as you go in, you remember in the, in the hot strip mill, you, you go from high temperatures, somewhere 1300, down to uh, the uh, austenite, ferrite transformation, and then uh, you coil the material, and there it cools down very slowly to room temperature. Okay, so as you, uh, the temperature decreases, the next thing that forms are sulfides. In the IF steels, the sulfides of titanium. Yes. And in the temperature range where we reheat the material, yes, we form continue forming titanium nitride, sulfide, and if the temperature is slightly lower than 1200 degrees C, we form this carbosulfide. Yes? It's a very interesting reaction because you form these particles here. You can see them here, titanium sulfide particles. Half of this particle is a titanium sulfide. The other half is a carbosulfide. So, and as you decrease the temperature, uh, titanium sulfide, titanium nitride is fully precipitated. No, all, there's no more nitrogen. The titanium sulfide is pre precipitated. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, stabilized all the sulfur. Carbosulfide may have formed if your slab reheating temperature was low enough, yes? And you start forming titanium carbide, <coughs> uh, mainly, in the runout table, in the cooling section, yes? Uh, obviously by reaction of titanium and carbon. It's not uh, the only uh, strange things that happens in uh, titanium IF steels. Titanium IF steels obviously uh, are ideally uh, designed for processing in, in a continuous annealing line, yes? But because they have, they're so robust, you can, you can also process them in a batch annealing furnace. There's nothing wrong about uh, doing that. However, if you do that, uh, and your steel contains phosphorus, yes, uh, and usually there are very small amounts of phosphorus, the titanium uh, carbide and the uh, and phosphorus may give rise to a compound FETI phosphorus, yes? Uh, and it can either uh, g be made from the carbosulfide or the, or the, or the regular uh, titanium carbide. So although the um, IFCs are much more robust in terms of processing, yes, uh, you, you're still dealing with steels where you know, you, you have to watch uh, 
the, the way you process them. But in principle, um, uh, whatever the coiling temperature you use, you can process them in a batch annealing furnace or in a, uh, a continuous annealing uh, furnace. And um, in, in contrast to the low carbon steels where you, you really have to choose the way you're going to anneal them and, um, and, 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 and then decide and pick the right uh, coiling temperature. All right, we've come to the, um, the end of the uh, lecture. Thank you very much.